the formal opening of the 16th biennial conference in virtual Lisbon with the theme New Anthropological Horizons in and Beyond Europe. We already have over 1,900 delegates, which makes this the biggest virtual conference in anthropology to date, I think. I hope you've already experienced some of the rich offerings of this conference over the last two days of network meetings, panel film showings, an art exhibition, round tables and labs. And there's a great deal more to come. Just to give you an idea of the order of activity uh, this evening, we'll have a few introductory remarks for about 15 minutes. Uh, which will be followed by Marilyn Strathern's lecture and some final words from me. We won't be taking questions, but we will be having a reception at 7 p.m. Uh, Lisbon time, about half an hour after the end of this welcoming uh, event. So let me start uh, with giving the floor to our hosts from Lisbon. Um, first, we'll hear a message from Maria de Lourdes Rodriguez, uh, the rector of ISCTE, the Institute of the University of Lisbon. Bem-vindos à 16ª Conferência da European Association of Social Anthropologists. Bem-vindos ao ISCTE, Instituto Universitário de Lisboa. Bem-vindos a Lisboa. É para nós um enorme orgulho acolher esta iniciativa tão excepcional num tempo também ele excepcional. Há 30 anos, a quando da realização da primeira conferência em Coimbra, não era possível imaginar que o regresso a Portugal seria um regresso marcado pelo distanciamento. Esta conferência marca o momento em que os antropólogos afirmaram a sua vontade e determinação para prosseguir o seu trabalho, para continuar a dialogar e a estudar a diversidade do mundo, para continuar a olhar os desafios atuais e a emergência de novas ameaças. Faço votos para que esta conferência seja um êxito e faço votos também para que em breve possam regressar a Lisboa, regressar realmente a Lisboa. Thank you, uh, Professor de Lourdes Rodrigues, for that really warm welcome. Next, we'll have a short note from Karin Wall, the Dean of ICS, the Institute of Social Sciences at the University of Lisbon. Hello, I'm Karin Wall, Dean of ICS, the Institute of Social Sciences of the University of Lisbon, one of the organizers of this conference. On behalf of the University of Lisbon, I'd like to welcome you all to the 16th conference of the European Association of Social Anthropologists. This is, for many reasons, an extraordinary conference and a memorable date. First and foremost, because this is a virtual conference in troubled times. Yet, the numbers attending are impressive, meaning that the Yaza community has grown and meaning that meeting this huge challenge, bringing social anthropologists together in an online meeting, was the right decision and a step which we fully supported. It was also important to organize this conference without delay because as anthropologists there are major issues on the table which you have to interpret and understand now on the spot. The challenges are many. The pandemic is intensifying ideological tensions related to social categories and identities, Afro-American, Black, Indigenous, related to history and the reinterpretation of history related to inequalities. Another overarching uh, challenge is the reinforcement of borders, boundaries, barriers, both material and symbolic. We have to contend with increasing barriers to democracy, to ideas, to migration, to global solidarity across countries and borders. Another huge challenge are methodological and ethical issues what are social anthropologists going to do re in, in relation to fundamental experiences such as participant observation or visual ethnography? Secondly, this is a memorable conference because IASA is celebrating 30 years of existence. The founding conference was 30 years ago. Its title was uh, Anthropology and Europe. At that time, anthropologists and social scientists in general 
were having to create bridges between European societies, building up knowledge, cooperation, exchange between European societies. Today, as European social, social scientists, we have to bridge to the whole world. My final message to you relates to the social sciences. Being a sociologist myself, I'm deeply concerned with the lack of investment in the type of knowledge we produce. As social scientists, we have to ensure and understand complexity. We also have to be critical. And we have to connect the broad landscape of structural change with the detail of human suffering and human experience. So this is the last point of my message. We have to work together to ensure that social science generally is supported and taken more seriously by governments, universities, publics, the European Union. I wish you a productive and inspiring conference, and I hope that you will all be able to come to Portugal, to Lisbon, very soon. Thank you, Professor Wall. I certainly uh, share your view that now is the time to speak up for the social sciences and to come together uh, in the quite serious battle to defend it, both across Europe and in the world more widely. Next, we're going to hear from Susana Fiegas, one of the two leaders of the Lisbon-based Conference Planning Committee and a member of the Scientific Committee. The all it is with great oh, emotion yep. that we welcome you to EASA 2020 Lisbon. 30 years have passed since the first conference took place in 1990 at the University of Coimbra. By then, hope and rejoice were strongly felt in the air, and for long years, we heard of good memories of that moment. When we proposed the conference to be held in Lisbon, this was a principal motivation. In the last two years, Miguel Valdal Medi and I have been working together with the local committee, and this is a particularly huge local committee, so I'm going to show you who they are. It is an unusual large local committee joining anthropologists from every single institution where research and teaching in anthropology is undertaken in Portugal. While the first conference was organized by João Pina Cabral, assisted by José António Fernandes Bias, Manuel Laranjeira, and with considerable input from Adam Cooper and Daniel, Daniel de Coupé, 30 years after, we have a dynamic anthropology in Portugal. We joined for two years' work. It was hard work covering many different areas, some of which became completely obsolete for the virtual version. But together as a team, we did overcome the hurdles. Maintaining the date of the conference, in turning it online was a difficult decision. But we had in hand an excellent scientific program, and as Karen Wall has just said, this would be, it actually is, an opportunity to think together on the spot. The virtual turn was, of course, kind of a turmoil. We have been able, however, to rethink and hopefully have been able to find ways of making you feel in Lisbon, even if at a distance. Please do not turn, out your, turn off your computer after Marlene's keynote. Uh, the so-called welcome reception, which is at 7 p.m., will be shown to you in only 20 minutes of chosen video clips of amazing music showing Lisbon through the eyes of our choice of artists. Please take special notice of Yulinda's music Fontanning at the Ancient Art Museum in Lisbon. And stay for the final party. Tired looking at the screen, you may get your eyes away and listen to a great DJ, Bruntuma. He usually performs in a well-known club in Lisbon, Beleza. Bruntuma has a unique proposal for us. You can cook dance or just lay on the sofa. He will, however, move your body, so do not miss it. And before that, enjoy and profit from the remarkable scientific program we have the honor to host. 
And most of all, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Susanna, not only for your words and wishes, but uh, for all that you've done to make this a wonderful event. And finally, a few words from Miguel Valle d'Almeida, uh, the other key leader of the local planning committee in Lisbon. Susanna and I would like to hear you. thank a few institutions that were uh, fundamental to make the face-to-face -face conference uh, uh, successful. First of all, ISCTE, the University Institute of Lisbon, and ICS, the Institute of Social Sciences of the University of Lisbon, the hosts of this conference, but also CRIA, the Center for Research in Anthropology, uh, and its associated universities, Nova University of Lisbon, University of Coimbra, and University of Minho. We would also like to thank the Portuguese Anthropological Association and the Museums of Natural History, of Ethnology, Bordalo Pinheiro, and the Lisbon Municipality. We'd also like to thank Pedro Aranda, who, has, who had prepared the fabulous catering for the conference, and Mafalda Mel Souza, who worked for the local committee. But especially I'd like to thank Nomad IT and Rowan and Trino in particular, because they were fantastic working mates in preparing the conference. Also, the executive committee of EASA and the scientific committee were uh, our partners in deciding to go virtual and also in establishing what I think is an excellent scientific program. These are very hard times that we're going through, but we as anthropologists and academics uh, persevered and we even innovated by going virtual. We have a big job to do ahead of us. I think that we should um, be part of making the world intelligible. I think it's also our job to show how unequal this world is, but most of all, and through our ethnographic approach, we can show the diversity of solutions that emerge among the diversity of the world's cultures and peoples. So welcome to Lisbon, a city in Europe, but pretty much a city beyond Europe already. Happy 30th anniversary and welcome. I want to thank you anyway on behalf of EASA. I want to thank our hosts in Lisbon for the extraordinary amount of work they've put in not only uh, before we had to make the decision to go online, but also afterwards. Uh, the mark of true academic collaboration is when people, groups and organizations give all their energy and resources in pursuit of a collective goal, even when the personal costs of doing that are very high. Our colleagues in Lisbon did not hesitate when it became clear that the work they had put in for two years to make the face-to-face -face part of this event a truly unforgettable one, would have to be redesigned for an online experience. They simply worked with us and with our superb conference organizers, Nomad IT, to make it a wonderful experience online instead. It is for this reason that I repeat that this is the 16th biennial EASA Lisbon Lisboa conference. Without our colleagues in Lisbon, it would have been something entirely different. Thank you, truly, EASA, is very much in your debt. Most of all, this event is a celebration, a celebration of 30 years of the existence of EASA, a celebration of the intellectual work that goes into making anthropology a vibrant, sparky, critical, and always fascinating discipline, even in these troubled times. Troubled not only because of COVID-19, but also because of the climate crisis because of the issues of ongoing prejudice and inequality highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement, the Decolonize movement, and the Me Too campaign, all of which contribute to our own internal disciplinary struggles. And we are living through troubled times because of the political and economic threats to higher education and research, and the ongoing precaritization of academic work in many parts of the world. This is a celebration of all those colleagues who are, despite all of that, battling often daily and often with considerable risk to themselves to work on behalf of anthropology and the social sciences more widely against multiple political, economic and institutional challenges. This is a celebration and a thanks to all of you for what you are doing to inspire, encourage and keep working towards making anthropology the diverse, messy and always critical discipline that it is. This is a celebration of the amazing things that can be achieved when colleagues in this discipline come together and share their ideas and their work. Thanks to all of you, 
the paper presenters and panel organizers, the filmmakers, the round table conveners, the art exhibition organizers, the lab developers, the publishers, and other book exhibition participants, the EASA networks, the plenary organizers and plenary speakers, the small army of volunteers helping with all the technical details, the people providing the music and the background images, and a special thank you to the scientific committee, the film selection committee, the Lisbon local committee, our hosts, ISCTE, University Institute of Lisbon, and ICS, University of Lisbon. And of course, thank you again to Nomad IT, who have pulled off a miracle with going online with such a large conference. Thanks to all. And now, it's my real privilege to introduce EASA's keynote speaker for this conference, Marilyn Strathern. Of course, she really needs no introduction. She's been one of the most creative and inspiring ethnographers and thinkers in anthropology for over four decades. She's also been one of the greatest supporters of EASA from its foundation and was a former president of the association in the late 1990s. Marilyn Strathern has been a leading light in many subfields of the discipline over the years, most notably in the anthropology of gender, of kinship, of exchange and property, of persons and the anthropology of knowledge. Also from the beginning, feminist issues and through this concerns about inequalities and how they might be understood anthropologically has informed her work. Within all of this, the concept of relations has always been present, weaving through her work from a variety of angles, perspectives and perspectival approaches. That has culminated most recently in the book Relations, an Anthropological Account, which looks critically at the history of the word in English and how that might have shaped how Anglophone anthropology developed its understanding of kinship. The book is a brilliant example of how Strathern leaves no stones unturned. Throughout her career, she has paid as much attention to where the concepts that anthropology draws upon have come from as she has to the concepts she was encountering while carrying out her research, both in the highlands of Papua New Guinea and in the UK. Marilyn Strathern has published some 16 books, 44 journal articles, and 57 book chapters, and I'm sure I'm out of date already. Every one takes the reader through a journey and an invitation to think otherwise. Although the texts often require careful reading because they, every detail of what she writes matters. She is an immensely generous thinker. She provides opportunities for readers to draw on what she says and bring it into relation with their own interests and ethnographic experience. Her work leaves doors open rather than closing them. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to hand the floor to Marilyn Strathern, who will be giving the 16th EASA keynote lecture entitled Terms of Engagement. Marilyn. Well, welcome everyone. It, uh, you realize what an honor it is of me to be giving this anniversary lecture. In the present circumstances and knowing how difficult things have been in recent weeks, I thank everybody who's come to this occasion, even though I can't see you and wherever you are. What I hope you will be seeing is something of the magnificent context that Lisbon offered us. My real thanks indeed to the Lisbon Local Committee the images they have provided. Wrapped up in that are all the thanks due to our organisers and their different teams. It is wonderful that we have a conference at all. As to new anthropological horizons in Europe and beyond, I reflect on something precious to social anthropology. Our practices of exposition, how we describe and explain and convey through language that, as it turns out, works at once with us and against us. In place of your live presence, and knowing there'll not be much that you don't know already, I'd like to imagine you can sit back and relax and give rein to your own thoughts too. And for you to imagine me first writing this in April and May, because I wanted to start at a moment three months ago when all Europe was in lockdown. And I'm going to talk on terms of engagement. April the 10th. The event by itself seems nothing. 
a TV program on the scientific fight back to COVID-19, descriptions of the virus with eye-watering visuals accompanied a narrative of possible links to wildlife markets, city-sized bat populations, and viral mutation encouraged by intensive farming. It then switched to numbers, showing how reproduction can speed up. Only fleetingly mentioned was the way different countries acted, that presumably not being part of the science, although it was surely part of the pandemic. It was, however, noted that South Korea, prepared by SARS, was relying on mass testing. It is illuminating, looking back. The programme planted the suspicion that the UK's restricted testing was only recording 5 to 10% of the cases. On other occasions, UK scientists have been less reticent in saying that the government was not learning from experience elsewhere. But on the BBC News, the very next morning, April the 12th, the government, in the person of the Minister for Health, said just that. He was quizzed about the British Medical Association stating once again they didn't have enough personal protective equipment and the biggest death toll so far was announced. He was pressed by an interviewer clearly looking for some admission of responsibility. The interviewer was stark. Lives have been unnecessarily lost. The minister freely admitted that his brief was to look after people's lives Yet he then repeatedly asserted variations of we must take it from where we are now. Where they were now was not just the farce over equipment, but acting against WHO advice on mass testing. And in this absurd matter of PPE, the minister explicitly said that we should grasp matters as they indeed are now and not dwell on what's past. Yet the line between premature accountability and learning from previous actions is a fine one. Letting the public hear that the Minister for Health is cognizant of past problems would at least signal that there is something to learn. Let's take it from here. There is nothing to learn. I'll come back to the link between these episodes. And uh, this is the Aula Magna. Where we where we would have been uh, talking and discussing and and meeting. Do you recall that first glorious moment when the balconies of Milan spilled over with music? It had already become a genre when a colleague in Leiden sent me a zoomed performance from the Rotterdam Philharmonic. On April the 11th, the BBC News also played a short piece from two musical families who happened to be next-door neighbours in Cardiff, hailing from the National Orchestra of Wales, the Chamber Orchestra of Europe, the Irish Chamber Orchestra, and the Welsh National Opera. I evoke the European music makers because I want to change the mood set by COVID-19. But a change of mood that is not putting one's head in the sand. The musicians showed up the constrained circumstances of lockdown, neither denying nor overcoming them, but demonstrating that other things are possible. That is, they were addressing the conditions or terms of the restrictions, a critical intervention, if you like. And they surely demonstrated the power of learning. Now, their houses had back gardens, running between them a fence, with a hole in it. The hole enabled the Cardiff players to adapt how they rehearsed, keeping distance while able to hear one another and drawing to the occasion diverse disciplines of musical performance, new and old learning together. I am talking to you through a fence. And I want to draw on our discipline as anthropologists and its internal diversity and in referring to an aspect of what anthropologists do to address that as an issue in its own terms without feeling that our cumulative expertise is somehow rendered irrelevant by current events any more than the musician's expertise is. In fact, by the end, it might even seem rather pertinent. 
Recall the link between the TV programme and the news item. Relating them adds a dimension to each. Hardly unusual. It's the kind of relation we make all the time in joining up bits of a universe that might otherwise seem disparate. This is, of course, how the science was portrayed, linking, linking a virus leaping across species to animal-rearing practices speeding up viral reproduction. At the same time, separation being a relation from another point of view, an anthropologist would say, what was scientific about such knowledge was separated from other issues, just as the minister could separate himself from an immediate past. That said, the suspicion about testing made suspicious in turn the minister's insistence that everything was under control. One commentator on the UK governmental coronavirus briefings borrowed a Russian anthropologist's famous term for fake normality, hypernormalization. They're lying, we know they're lying, and they know that we know they're lying. Whether to link or separate them, making relations is the stuff of criticism as well as the stuff of suspicion. And suspicion rebounds on those who are suspicious. For as much as relations reveal what is not immediately apparent and extend questions about responsibility, they are also hazardous. Writers and thinkers beware for making relations is more generally central to how writers and thinkers expound things. There is no guarantee that simply because they are made, relations will be either truthful or helpful. But in the English language, at least, they are essential terms, key elements of exposition. Exposition implies getting a reader or listener to understand and the relations being drawn help form what is explained, how it's used, and what is omitted. For any anthropologist, the issue is as, is as routine as it is for a TV programmer or a minister on the defensive. Practices of anthropological exposition are normally open to academic argument through our familiar categories of description, analysis, and theory we both operationalize and contest one another's languages. At the same time, exposition is all of these and something else. It will also be drawing on assumptions, coloring, sentiments, dogmas, all of which may work their rhetorical effect unseen, completely unsurprising. But it means that here, indeed, the terms on which anthropologists engage with their materials can sometimes work as much against them as with, as with them. Interesting to think about this particular hazard in a multilingual company. Anthropology is, after all, nothing if it's not a particular way of describing the world, especially when resurgent boundaries and exclusions twist truth-telling and faking any which way, there is good reason to be thinking about our habits of exposition. The issue weaves in and out of what we might make of engagement, and then again, what we might make of its terms. First then, engagement. The grounds of or terms on which people engage with one another or with what they imagine is their world can also be called rules or conditions of engagement as when we talk of limiting conditions. Engagement is an ever-present preoccupation for anthropologists insofar as they are inevitably grounded at some point in someone's real world they have a collective concern with respect to one another's interlocutors. Thus, despite innumerable controversies and contestations, an unspoken rule of thumb is the fallback courtesy of respecting colleagues' ethnographic reporting, or at least until argued otherwise. For the anthropologist, 
the default position of trust does not just apply to ethnographers' methods and motivations, but entails a suspension of disbelief in whatever real world ethnographers find themselves in. Additionally, and beyond modes of analysis and theory more readily open to critical scrutiny, trust is also put in disciplinary modes of exposition. Where so much rests on a condition of initial trust, it'll matter what wider currency trust has. After all, trust from one perspective may seem collusion from another. There are always alternative routes to truth, and challenges may throw taken for granted conditions of knowledge production under suspicion, as in decolonizing the curriculum. Here, insofar as the call to decolonize anthropology as usual reappraises what's important for and by whom, it then uses distrust in some terms of engagement to urge trust in others. Yet by itself, the phrase terms of engagement often has a ring of mutuality to it, the assumption of something agreed upon, as in the terms of a contract or the protocols of a military encounter. Yet rules and conditions may diverge. The rules of a game can be different from the conditions of play. Parties seemingly subject to conditions beyond their control may still be engaging one another according to their own rules. Indeed, it's a moot point as to what kind of agreement might be involved when anthropologists talk of engagement with their interlocutors. Procedures for obtaining consent, for instance, variously serve as institutional insurance, as making a deal, or as tokens of more encompassing respect. In any case where people are concerned, trust or otherwise will be subject to the unfolding unpredictability of relations. Let me be more concrete. From forced migration to gender inequality to climate change, an agreement of sorts among the discipline's practitioners supposes that anthropology is fit to embrace what are also often urgent public issues. Two overviews of such engagement were carried out not so long ago. The first deployed a well-tried mode of academic del deliberation to address faking in a post-truth era. A workshop held in Germany led to a collection of essays mapping out an anthropology of defrauding and faking published in EASA's journal last year. Through materials drawn largely from African countries, the essays set out an agenda of general theoretical interest. The journal's editors observed both the worldwide antiquity and the novelty of the theme. Trickery and defrauding are hardly new, yet there is something new about their worldwide reach. The cases were thoroughly transnational. The collection began with a media story of a fake US embassy in Ghana selling forged visas, and then a further story that the first one was fake. No such scam existed. The multi-layeredness of these events exemplified deterioration of trust in institutions and symbols that once seemed reliable, calling something fraud or fake has become a shortcut term for uncertainties of all kinds. The Ghanaian non-scam was sowing deliberate confusion, spreading generalized mistrust. This anthropological foray shows how engagement with contemporary concerns can become a stimulus for another kind of engagement with the ethnographic enterprise. Specific situations show up the extent to which, in the interests of fraud, trust is at once exploited and regenerated. I quote, studying defrauding and faking is necessarily also a study about practices that produce the very underlying distinctions of the genuine and the fraudulent. 
fake money-making schemes and the literature on them alone is worldwide, are not aberrations, but routine phases in the business cycles of capitalist economies. One such account from Sierra Leone talks of the stunning performance of a money doubler, promising to double people's money, who brought the ethnographer to the brink of believing in and entrusting money to him. Yet for all the ethnographer's readiness to enter into the rules of the game, the respective conditions under which money circulates, the degree of material hardship separated him from the trickster and the trickster's usual clients. At the same time as the German workshop, a different mobilization of anthropological engagement was afoot. The American anthropologist was seeking a set of turnaround commentaries on what anthropologists do and have done, in this case, about nativism, nationalism, and xenophobia. The request was phrased in terms of how anthropologists resist, interpret, and otherwise respond to protectionist movements as regimes under which they live. Contributors were asked what they judged crucial in their conduct of an anthropological life. What were the audiences with which they could effectively engage? For a further question raises its head when scholarship itself, regardless of content, falls under suspicion. A remark made of India could be of anywhere. Right-wing nationalism is highly suspicious of intellectual pursuits in general. Aside from academic censorship and the suppression of criticism, other unspoken terms of engagement swing into view when it's the very apparatus of argument, evidence, analysis, which is regarded with enmity. Epistemology is, after all, a scholar's principal tool. Another contributor writes of a post-fact paradigm of political rhetoric where stories are invented about Europe suffering under immigration. Political regimes flourishing on disinformation is nothing new. Yet what a fake and fraud when all kinds of utterances can be equally propagated or dismissed as intent to deceive. A seemingly widespread imputation is of interests drive everything. There are UK politicians for whom lying does not matter when everyone is suspected of acting out of partisan or personal interest. When those who make up fake stories are like those who dismiss other stories as fake, lies are everywhere and only interests are real. So if you're not being asked to trust the speaker, trust isn't trust is not being regenerated. Trust isn't even required. A lie does its work if it simply disrupts other interests in mobilizing one's own. Whereas the transnational nature of many scams struck the workshop conveners, this second collection comments on personal and professional dangers facing anthropologists. It points to an erosion of what we might call safe spaces for anthropological work in the precarity of educational institutions. Widespread mistrust of institutions as such, they all have vested interests, leads to deactivation, or as in the case of the Brazilian National Indian Foundation, Funai, perversion, and thus the attrition of media that provide locales of expertise and criticism. One might reflect on the conditions of engagement of anthropologists' own institutions, such as EASA and the AAA, themselves conditional on safe places for meeting and publishing. There was a moment in Poland when, prompted by open racism, 25 anthropological institutions put on a special convention of Polish ethnologists and anthropologists with EASA and AAA in support, and anthropologists visibly swam against the current. Of course, the resulting manifesto was never enough by itself, but some things simply had to be said. 
And again, a commentator on the Association of University Graduates in Anthropology in Argentina notes that different departments are constantly working against the growth of repressive politics and actions, including xenophobia and persecution of social activists. Anthropological associations are but tiny signs of the precariousness of institutions of all kinds, including, believe it or not, bureaucracies or effective parliamentary oppositions. Put in their place is the voice or will of the people, a rhetoric that flourishes in situations of generalized mistrust. For all the qualifications one might wish to bring to anthropologists' trust of the ethnographer, professional trust was shaped by the European Enlightenment and the scientific revolution. Trust the method. Techniques of verification and proof were built into the very instruments of investigation, terms of engagement taken out of practitioners' hands. Very much left in practitioners' hands remained the credibility of the social person latterly expressed in terms of academic performance and publication profile. Special forms of scholarly mistrust came to flourish alongside. They included scientific doubt, the professional ignorance that spurs further study, as well as critical discourses of all kinds. Critical scholarship is often ameliorative in intent, though in form it may be indistinguishable from venomous attack. Everything rests indeed on the terms of engagement, such as on how writer and reader, whether or not known to one another, meet in the text in question. Think of that ethnographer investigating money scams whose trust in his own senses was thrown awry by a clever defrauding scheme. For a certain kind of modern subject, Trust is a default position, distinguishing some relations from others, friend from enemy, or if there's little trust in persons or politicians are liars, then it may be invested in institutional procedures in the conventions of, say, commerce. Of course, institutionalization finds its critics too. Frequently voiced is criticism of regimes of accountability, the very regulations meant to beat mistrust. In the social sciences, building the avoidance of mistrust into investigative procedures creates new areas of mistrust, this time with measurements and indicators. Rather than using trust to deceive someone as the Sierra Leone money doubler duped the unwary, educational auditors may be gen generating generalized mistrust in order to be seen to be combating a widespread threat, and we may well ask who is deceiving whom. Here's something interesting. Suppose trust were not a default position. This is the argument of a recent study in the High Atlas of Morocco. Among men, friendship is not predicated on trust. The terms of engagement are instrumentalism and interest. Axiomatically, I quote, everybody without exception is untrustworthy. One consequence is that men lie without intending to deceive. Plausible falsehoods deceive no one. In this respect, the situation is for all the world like the kind of pre-commercial society imagined in the Scottish Enlightenment before anonymous self-interest in the marketplace was separated from disinterest among friends. Backing off from coercion as they back off from speculating about the minds of others, these men of the Atlas value autonomy and egalitarianism, but as a contingent rail politic, not as an ideological project. Indeed, the ethnographer recounts the pitfalls of waiting the unwary field worker who would seek to build relations of trust. His own participation was sought in the local currency of friendship, affording assistance, doing favours, contributing to enterprises, an example of anthropological engagement that is, insofar as it can be, 
non-interventionist. Quite otherwise is engagement with interlocutors who might be called activists and who sometimes prompt something like an activist response on the investigator's part. I recall that our president's first fieldwork was with feminist activists in late 1980s London. Their battles over gender, sexuality and identity were, among other things, over the kinds of communities that might be true to their situation. That said, her own position as to what counts as intervention in anthropological terms is addressed, and I quote, rather to engagement within the world of which anthropology is a part, not so much in terms of the activism of particular anthropologists, but more in terms of the political implications of different ways of thinking anthropologically. And there's an interesting twist to this. Social experiments have long captured the imagination. I briefly introduce an instance from Spain with a nod towards the popular assemblies that flourished there in the wake of the Spanish Occupy movement. By contrast with the high atlas, the social environment is highly institutionalized and critical action invariably involves counter institutionalization, manifest in how people set up meetings, rearrange urban spaces and such. Appropriate social forms are apprehended ideologically, named and carried forward with lives of their own. Thus, well-tried questions about distributed authority and consent-based decision-making, concepts familiar enough then, equally inform today's explicit rules of engagement for climate activi activism in, for example, Extinction Rebellion. The Spanish experiments in question belonged to that same culture of activism and were articulated as intervention. Activists would be nothing without their own interests. Indeed, we might say that this kind of intervention is bound to be an enactment of them. Thus did a set of artists in Barcelona participate in an anthropological study at a moment when they were defining their own work as social practice art. Cancelling the division between experts and lay people, art and life, they acted out universal utopias, an ideological project seeking a transformation of the social. The artist's intention was to make things happen, produce events, the object being a social configuration such as commerce or community. Social practice artists offered a form of work, the ethnographer says, that helps anthropologists think about theirs. If they've long been articulated as desirable terms of engagement, how collaboration or co-authorship gets finessed remains open to experimental appropriation. I quote, anthropologists may learn about anthropology precisely from the way that artists have appropriated it. Artists who defined their calling as social practice, working in public spaces, included in their modes of engagement social and cultural theory, and anthropology in particular. And this is the twist. They were not just like anthropologists. Some had university degrees in the subject. As for appropriation, anthropology outside the academy takes its own forms, and we might want to be grateful for that. The way scholars look to or appropriate their own practices of thought is also a way of looking after them. Conversely, if taking care of their conceptualizations is among anthropologists' terms of academic engagement with one another, so surely is interest in how the concepts they use are used in other locations. Let's pause for fresh air. I've moved swiftly across many locales and you yourself will have many more to add. Innumerable circumstances invite us to think about the understandings that allow anthropologists to work at all, patterns of trust or mistrust implied. Indeed, trust and mistrust can adhere to the very words they deploy. 
The terms of analysis I've been using, engagement, may seem rather benign, or then again can acquire negativity. Not so long ago, when engaged anthropology, along with action or public anthropology, was championed for its ethics, it was also criticised for the interests it voiced in defence of certain social forms. Of course, we're not simply prey to the endlessly changing connotations of particular words. There are scholarly choices to be made. Nonetheless, an argument about the pitfalls of engagement can, in certain discourses, render the term ambiguous, just as collaboration, appropriation, or experiment can take positive or negative colouring. Other terms show more consistent values, think, say, of fraud and deceit. Yet terms themselves have been in the background to the discussion of engagement, where I have variously referred to rules, conditions, understanding. Let me now foreground terms. You might have imagined that whatever the substance of engagement, it will be defined or stabilised by the precise terms that hold us in place. Yet precision can be a highly dependent variable. Consider the terms under which EASA was founded. Apart from the constitutive rules of membership, with the expectations that went into forming the association, the limits on its activities, and the ends, as in goal or ambition, of its endeavours, all of varying significance to its members. No less disconcerting is the fact that the word also denotes itself as a word. In English, a term is a verbal expression often used as a synonym for word or phrase. So the double meaning of term encompasses at once rules and assumptions and the linguistic manner of their specification. Of course, much disciplinary activity is concerned with striking a balance between agreements over concepts as to the credibility of specific definitions and experimentation with language leading to new horizons of expression. Out of this comes the empirical question of the way language is being used. For anthropologists, the question may be bound up with curiosity. Being curious in how words are activated can seem at least as interesting as defining or idealizing them. Indeed, curiosity is a form of scholarly interest that for anthropology is as ethnographically as it is theoretically fed. When it comes to terms or words, how things are includes practices of usage. Here an issue for concepts is also one for terms in this sense, their activation and animation as words, in short, their use in the course of social life. I take up terms as, an, as objects of curiosity. And in addition to moving across locales, you can also feed curiosity while staying in one place. We're in Queenborough. This is Ayaza in 1990. Adam Cooper's inspiration, Joan de Pina Cabral's hospitality, and Sildell Silverman making it all possible. Europe's many languages set the scene for our disciplinary heteroglossia, implying an ambition of common communication. One of Ayaza's goals was to embrace difference across Europe's scholarly traditions. However, this was also the venue of another of Ayaza's founding moments, debate over its language of business. The eventual outcome was no doubt influenced by what was already in use as a global language. In the words of a French colleague, English has become a sort of Latin, a convenient vehicle for exchanges within the scientific community. Yet rather than rehearse those EASA debates, curiosity might turn us in another direction. A language is no less idiosyncratic for being used as a lingua franca. What is this convenient vehicle from which anthropology derives so many 
terms of expression. Now here, I must declare an interest of sorts. Despite passing public exams in three European languages, I never became multilingual. This brings me unlimited admiration for people who can listen to, write, and give papers in other than their mother tongue. And I am directly addressing many of you. I honestly don't know how you do it. And that also means that what follows is not linguistically informed. And that very incapacity puts me, me, in a curious relation to language. It makes me nervous. Utterance as such may be suspicious. What is speech? asked Charlemagne's son, Pepin. The betrayer of the soul, that is a thought, just as early English Quakers took words to be seducers of the mind. However, I turn attention to this language, English, not to problematize the ineffable or illusory, nor dwell on fakery or deceit, but to take up words as we determinedly use them in pursuit of our studies. It's a matter of not completely trusting what is useful and indeed much used. And were I to further focus on a single term, I'm sure many of you know that relation has piqued, has piqued my curiosity for a long time. It is, after all, among anthropologists' prime term of engagement. Let me dwell on relation as a term, a word. Relation has its own character in English. On the one hand, on the one hand, like link or knowledge, for an anthropologist constructing a narrative, the term generally has positive connotations. Arguments flow through the relations that are made. Vernacular usage will speak to bonds of commonality that are benign before they're anything else. Conversely, it often casts a negative tenor over separation or difference. On the other hand, relations ubiquity also conveys a generic quality, and when designating kin, as in the substantives relation or relative, it makes an abstraction out of connections more vividly rendered through blood or genes. Those curious about English languages might remark that such designation of kin is a largely English idiosyncrasy. Whatever is being bundled together in the single word when it emerged as a key term of 20th century British social anthropology, it carried a real-world resonance with the interconnectedness of ideas, persons, structures. Identifying relations worked as an end point of anthropological endeavour. Now, these assertions might be more wisely rendered in terms of analytical or theoretical choice. Yet there is a force to the English language term relation that does not seem reducible to scholarly discernment. Think of certain Anglo-Gallic perplexities over dissent and alliance still in the air 30 years ago. To those who thought the whole must come before the parts, the apparently fragmented correlations of English-speaking anthropologists were simply incomplete. But suppose English speakers were endowing relations with something like a generative power, the positive capacity to create links as between descent groups. The formula would only scandalize theorists to whom a condition of social formation already included such links. Notions of relational capacity then would make a difference to exposition. Of course, we also learn from one another as in the subsequent popularity of Francophone, Francophone forms of expression on Anglophone anthropology. So common to the unremarkable, a particular construction of the relation might hold our curiosity for a moment. I refer to what happens when the preposition between follows. Inter, 
a Latin-derived counterpart to the Anglo-Saxon word, is equally common, and the construction relation between is certainly not exclusive to English. Patterns of use is another matter, however, and English speakers use it even where logic might suggest otherwise. A recent French commentator is worth listening to. He is discussing external and internal relations, a distinction anthropologists sometimes take up. Anglophone expressions for internal relations, those constitutive of the reality of the terms being related, habitually draw on interpersonal examples. I quote, The difficulty we have in understanding internal relations often arises from the examples that we're asked to consider and from a language that mixes logical interests with considerations that are entirely foreign to logic. Individuals are mentioned, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. We're then told that there exists between them a relationship that plays a substantial role in their lives, so much so that it's declared that the relationship is internal. For if it were not internal, it would be superficial, inconsequential, like the fact of being seated next to a stranger in the metro. Yet the very language in which we're invited to posit this internal relationship indicates that it is rather a connection that is exterior to the reality of both parties, since it is, as we have just said, between them. In short, as an individual, each spouse is absolutely distinct, whereas, logically speaking, a relation cannot be internal if it is posited between entities conceived as independent of and thus external to each other. Internal relations can only link relative beings, not as elements, but as parts of a whole. Now, holistic expositions presuppose an encompassing structure where the role of relations is to specify the way its parts move with one another. Relations are everywhere, coextensive with the whole, the, dependent of the dependence of each upon all being self-evident. In atomistic expositions, by contrast, pre-existing entities supposedly enter into relations with one another, creating links that remain external to each. That said, Suppose neither of these visions quite captures vernacular English usage. We've just been given the evidence. An acrobatic mix of the logical and non-logical, the hybrid Mr. and Mrs. Smith. The English notion of there being intrinsic relations between what are otherwise held separate may be imagined in such a way that the individuality of distinct beings seemingly coexists with relational understandings of their mutuality and dependence. Otherwise put, the vernacular truth seems to be that the phrase relation between applies indiscriminately, regardless of the interdependence or contingency of phenomena. Relations everywhere too, but are now like free agents with the potential to connect anything with anything else. If I state the obvious, that there are entailments to the constructions we use, it's not to recommend an ideal vocabulary, but rather to foster an ethnographic curiosity about usage, everyday and academic. One might wonder, for example, at the anglophone penchant for dyadic comparisons, as though parties to a relation naturally formed pairs, as though putting two things together would yield the similarities and dissimilarities that revealed the relation between them. A common objection is to point to the ground for comparison, the constituting third term that acts like the witnessing presence of a third party to an event. Taking neither side, I speculate as to whether there may be an English-speaking inclination to subsume the third position in the act of relating as though relating itself had a positive, taken-for-granted presence and autonomous capacity, and all we need to focus on is what are being related. 
Now, no one's being asked to agree to that speculation. Rather, it underlines the observation that the same practices of exposition that support anthropological analysis can also get in the way of it. Going beyond English usage alone, I pause now on some of the effects of external relations, namely where relating implies a supposition about the prior discreteness of entities and sustains the combination as a concept. Consider how the Latin for between, inter, works to bring things together by creating boundaries to cross. Thus the very construction of international simultaneously overcomes and emphasizes the distinctiveness of nations. A decade ago, a study of academic research across Europe, sponsored by the Czech Academy of Sciences, uncovered a constituent feature of disciplinary cultures. This was the gap between abstractly formulated policy imaginaries of science networks and togetherness in practice. The context was the relentless top-down promotion of interdisciplinarity in research, and European policy directives referring to the desirability of breaking down barriers between subject areas. In practice, reports of difficulties of interdisciplinary work were legion alongside other reports of the acceleration of ignoring boundaries altogether. Nonetheless, the notion of boundary crossing remained a policy marker of excellence. So the term interdisciplinary endures a mundane usage perpetuating the imagination of a world made up of otherwise unrelated entities. At its extreme, one wonders what support such external relating might give to diverse expressions of xenophobia. This is not to sidestep the kinds of social or historical analysis that engage many investigators, that will be absurd. I simply remark on the xenophobic appropriation of notions of inclusion and exclusion, given that they can apply anywhere to class, religion, ethnicity, and the culture. The same expositional use of relations between that would ameliorate the consequences of such exclusions, let's bridge the gap, cross the boundary, also perpetuates the ontological priority of those things. It is as though the more phenomena are described as individuated, the more interrelatedness is necessary. The more the need for interrelation is expressed, the more individuation seems insurmountable. This will be a rather gloomy note, note on which to end, except that we have a whole field of languages in front of us and manifold opportunities to work on the work of exposition, not just anthropological languages, but across all of Europe, everyone's vernaculars, potential sources of reflection, including reflection on the principal language of debate. If that remains English, we need to know what English entails. In being myself curious about the term relation, the intent has been at once ethnographic and critical. And in harnessing a critical curiosity about this global language, you probably know how suspiciously that particular term relation has been regarded by colleagues from other traditions. Notable Portuguese speaking and French speaking anthropologists themselves equally masters of English, I must add, have specifically appraised or voiced objections to what possibly thus emerge as idiosyncratic anglophone connotations. From time to time, anglophone colleagues comment on the fascination that comes from bringing discrete elements together. Perhaps this registers a small expositional gain offered by vernacular English usage when it makes a hybrid of sorts from not distinguishing external and internal relations. 
pursuing something as strong as interdependence, nonetheless expressed as relations between things, gives an impetus to curiosity itself, not least to its anticipation of the unexpected. Curiosity, curiosity can flourish in many ways, but possibly this is one of them. Oh, and another reason to lift the gloom because of what's happened. We're back in we're back in Lisbon, the Aula Magna, the exterior of the building where we would have been, uh, taken in 1963, the date of the, of the famous student protest um, against against the dictatorship. Thank you for bearing with me. A few concluding comments, including what's happened. I don't wish to transmit my nervousness over languages, but there is something to be learnt from taking care of our diverse vernaculars, especially those habits that guide exposition. The more we argue through commonly held theoretical and analytical assumptions, the more valuable such care seems. Thirty years ago, it was foreshadowed in Ayaz's hope of nourishing Europe's anthropological diversity. It can be said with a different inflection today. In tumultuous times, we need all the conceptual and expositional resources we can gather. This is not parochial. It's opening up to what otherwise often remain unspoken conditions of engagement, namely the influence of our own vernacular idioms, their affect, their grammar. It also makes explicit, indeed endorses, certain aspects of learning. However it's mediated, learning in the end is also learning from one another, from what others have described or demonstrated. Ignoring that is ignorance indeed. The callous political ignorance in the UK's reactions to coronavirus is a grim reminder. Yet, how to take care of our languages of exposition without policing them? The scholar has a trick up her sleeve, taking care by finding things interesting. An anthropologist's extra trick indeed lies in the particular form of curiosity one can call ethnographic. Delving into some of the connotations of relations has, from this perspective, meant engaging with the detail. Thus, it's thrown up the kind of positive tenor that often accompanies the English term, as well as the anticipation that anything may be related, and applies, of course, to academics, astrologers, and conspiracy theorists alike. Well, perhaps COVID-19 has taught the world something. It's not asking us to trust it, but it is very loudly making us ask what we can trust of one another. As in clearing the skies, the virus brought reality to recognizing what social scientists, ecologists, novelists, and thinkers of all stripes have been articulating for decades. Coexistence, interdependence, symbiosis, relationality. English is not, is not alone. But when they do use English, writers and thinkers have often had to struggle with the persistent grammatical presumption of phenomenal discreteness. This is of no little moment for a discipline engaged with diverse people in languages and cosmologies over and again telling it otherwise. Could COVID-19 help us re-render ethnographic understandings of those worlds whose premises never prioritized discreteness while bringing something fresh to those that do. The virus is meteor, colliding with old habits of exposition, will it collide too with how we deploy the term relation? Of course, the coronavirus doesn't care. Consider, however, what people are telling themselves about it. Banning intercountry travel, keeping everybody at a distance, Differentiating households, two meters here, three months there. Locking down populations could not more vividly announce we are already related. We live and breathe one another's air, including the strangers in the metro. And then again, relating 
is emphasized. Neighborhood consciousness, protocols for digital discourse, orchestral practice through a fence. Enforced isolation has brought home myriad ways in which one is linked to persons, to places, to the institutions of social life. Not to speak of relations of marginalization, intensified domestic violence and dire poverty. Under what conditions can the truth of social deprivation be seen? We have a stark answer in the pandemic. Even the notion of society has been brought back into political life. Yet over and again it's asked, do we want to bring things back? I pick up a detail from that reiterated question which drives the continuing climate emergency movement. As eloquently as melting glaciers and unseasonal tornadoes, the virus has shown the extent to which populations are related and has stimulated countless re-engagements with relating. It's a combination that diverse inflections of the term relation capacitate in diverse ways. But for us too, do we want to settle back into existing capacities for description? Shouldn't we allow ourselves to be shaken? If English speakers find it hard to think of separation or difference as a means of relating, think of keeping social distance as an expression of care, or fences and walls, either without holes in them, as bringing people together. Obviously, reconceptualization is forever on anthropologists' theoretical agenda. But doesn't learning imply acknowledging a difference between before and after? Of whatever stripe, anthropologists have paid attention to relations where others have not always done so. If a presumption of people's relatedness starts becoming common currency, part of the vernacular, the discipline's terms of engagement shift. And if indeed we can now take this kind of relating for granted, what critical space is opened up? Indeed, if we can take relating for granted, what then? Thank you, everybody, for being here and for being in your own here. Hello. That was a absolutely wonderful talk that um, I think it's I had a lot to say, but I've realized that now we've only got about uh, five minutes before we have to end. I think the key aspect of this that I really managed to get uh, from, from this enormously rich talk is the way in which that phrase, terms of engagement, implies there has to be a between, an inter, in the English language. And uh, critically questioning that uh, is... In, in the context of the political, um, social, environmental, uh, critical moment in which we're living uh, gives an enormous amount of food for thought. Uh, and uh, I think the way in which the question of how um, fakery and truth are constituted both within languages and within the context of thinking about relations is uh, an, an enormous contribution uh, that I think a lot of us are going to have to think about rather a, a lot. Uh, I think that I was going to, it seems that Marilyn Strathern herself has, has left us, so I was going to try and get an opportunity just for her to say a couple of words, but perhaps she'll turn up at the reception. I think Susanna Viegas, however, is still here uh, and in the last couple of minutes because she didn't have an opportunity to speak to you live I just want to ask her up to the podium to say a last few words and to warmly invite you to the reception in half an hour Susanna and um, don't miss the welcome reception um, hopefully you will really have the feeling of this room and have a nice conference just what to say to you. Thanks, Sarah. 
Thank you. And thanks to everybody who uh, got this far. Uh, I did have a lot to say about Stefan, but we've run out of time. So um, just see you in half an hour and at the rest of the conference. And I really hope you enjoy. And thank you all for joining us in this massive experiment. Thank you. Bye.